In today's experiment, we'll be using thermochemical reactions. We'll be looking at the amount of heat energy absorbed or released by a variety of different reactions to find out information about some common chemicals and commercial products. Throughout today's experiments, we're going to be using a homemade calorimeter. This can be prepared by attaching a beaker to a retort stand for stability. We're then going to use two polystyrene cups, one inside the other, as our insulated reaction vessel. We're going to place a piece of cardboard over the top to create an insulated lid. And then place a thermometer in the top of the reaction vessel. This thermometer will serve two purposes. It will work as a stirrer and also record the final temperature for us. In many cases, you can exchange a thermometer for a temperature probe, which is attached to an instrument that will give you a digital reading of your temperature. If this is available, I encourage you to use this instead of a thermometer. For your first experiment, we're going to look at the heat of dissolution of a couple of common ionic salts. We're going to dissolve these in a fixed amount of water in 15 grams. Throughout today, we'll be closely monitoring the mass of solution that we have involved in each reaction because it is the aqueous solution, or namely speaking, the water, that is going to be absorbing the thermal energy released by these different chemical reactions. So make sure you record the mass of water that we add to our reaction vessel. We're then going to look at the heat of dissolution of two ionic compounds, calcium chloride dihydrate and ammonium chloride. Starting with the calcium salt, weigh out approximately one gram on a top loading balance. Make sure you note down the exact mass that you added in your notes. Record an initial temperature. And then start your timer. Wait for 30 seconds to elapse. At that point in time, you can add your ionic solid to your calorimeter and then mix thoroughly to make sure the salt completely dissolves. Record the temperature of your reaction every 15 seconds in the table provided and use this information to calculate the enthalpy of your reaction. The enthalpy in this prac can be approximated to be the amount of heat absorbed or released by the chemical reaction. The first equation, Q equals ms delta T, will allow you to calculate Q, the amount of energy absorbed or released by the chemical reaction. The assumption we're making is that all energy absorbed or released can be measured by measuring the change in temperature of the water. This approximation should stand up pretty well. If we know the amount of energy absorbed or released, and we know the number of moles of the chemical participating in the reaction, we can calculate delta H, the enthalpy of the reaction. It tells us the number of kilojoules of energy absorbed or released per mole of chemical, as described in the chemical equation. We're going to be using this concept throughout today in many of the different sections of this experiment. Moving on to a different exercise, we're going to observe the thermal energy change, the heat change of a chemical reaction between brown vinegar and a base, and use that to determine the concentration of acetic acid in our vinegar. Collect a portion of brown vinegar, and then use a pipette to take a 25 ml aliquot of vinegar and deliver it into your calorimeter. Set up your calorimeter as normal. Wait 30 seconds to ensure the temperature is stable. At this point, add 10 mL of 2 molar sodium hydroxide to your reaction vessel. Try to ensure that you measure as close to 10 mL as possible because the massive solution that you add will affect the result that you calculate. Once you add the base, pop the cover back over and make sure you thoroughly mix the two chemicals. Record the temperature at 15 second intervals over a time of 5 minutes and plot a graph showing the temperature as a function of time. We can then use the same extrapolation technique as before to determine the energy released by this chemical reaction. With a few simple calculations, we can determine the concentration of acetic acid in our vinegar. Quickly discussing a strategy, so once again we can calculate the amount of energy transferred during the chemical reactions. This time we'll be using our thermochemical equation backwards. We already know the enthalpy of the reaction. We know how much heat energy is released per mole of reactant. Knowing that and the amount of energy released by our reaction, we can calculate how many moles of our reactant, of our acetic acid, were present in the 25 ml aliquot of vinegar. Before we discuss the third experiment for today, I need to draw your attention to the fact that we're using solid magnesium metal. Magnesium metal is a flammable solid and also reacts quite violently with acid to release hydrogen gas. Please make sure you treat it with care. We're going to use this magnesium metal along with magnesium oxide to try and determine the enthalpy of the reaction between magnesium and oxygen gas to produce solid magnesium oxide. Now this reaction in itself is extremely difficult to measure in the lab, so instead we're going to make use of Hess's law. We're going to measure the enthalpy of some more simple chemical reactions in the lab, and then we're going to use a combination of these three reactions and their enthalpies to determine the enthalpy of the overall reaction at the top of this page. To conduct the experiment, take approximately 0.25 grams of the solid magnesium metal. We're going to weigh the mass of magnesium metal by difference, so be sure to then measure it accurately on the analytical balance. 
Into our calorimeter, place 15 mils of 2 molar hydrochloric acid. Make that volume as accurate as possible and note down the volume that you add. This experiment must be done in the fume cupboard because the reaction between the magnesium metal and the acid releases hydrogen gas. We don't want large amounts of hydrogen gas in the lab. We also want to make sure there are no open flames in today's experiment. Once you're set up, you can start your reaction timer, and when it reaches 30 seconds, make sure the initial temperature is constant, and then add your magnesium metal to your acid. Be sure to mix thoroughly, you want to make sure all the magnesium metal reacts, and keep your weighing vial aside, you're going to need to go back to the analytical balance and weigh it again, so that you can determine the exact mass of solid magnesium you've added. Keep track of your temperature as a function of time, you'll need to keep track of this particular reaction for 10 minutes. Repeat this process using magnesium oxide instead of magnesium. Once again, record the mass accurately by weighing by difference. This time you can record the temperature over a five minute time period and plot your results on your graph provided. We now know the enthalpy of all three of the small reactions shown in the center of this page. By combining these equations, by adding or subtracting them, we can blend the three equations so that several of the chemicals cancel out, they appear on both sides, and we're left with our overall reaction at the top. We can combine the enthalpies in the same way and determine the enthalpy of the overall reaction. The final experimental section of today's prac involves the investigation of the unusual solubility properties of calcium sulfate. You'll be combining calcium chloride solutions with sodium sulfate solutions in order to see whether or not a precipitate forms. We're going to start with 2 mils of 1 molar calcium chloride and we're going to mix that with 2 mils of 1 molar sodium sulfate. Note that the concentration of both of these chemicals when you mix them will be less than 1 molar. We mix these two chemicals thoroughly to see whether or not a precipitate forms. You can see from this demonstration that sometimes it can take quite some time to see the formation of a precipitate. We're then going to try this reaction again using 0 0.001 molar calcium chloride and sodium sulfate and then 0.1 molar calcium chloride and sodium sulfate. And with this last reaction, the 0.1 molar solutions, we're also going to try it at an elevated temperature on a hot plate. Make sure the temperature is greater than 80 degrees Celsius. Record the temperature you use. These simple reactions will allow us to familiarize ourselves with the concept of Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy tells us whether or not a reaction should be spontaneous or not, and whether it will occur under the conditions specified. These equations here will help you calculate the Gibbs free energy. The superscript naught means standard state conditions, all concentrations one molar, all gases at one atmosphere. The second equation allows us to go from standard state conditions to non-standard state conditions. And so what I would like you to do is use these calculations to predict whether or not these reactions should occur or not, and then compare them with what you see in the lab when you actually conduct the experiments for yourselves. That covers all of the experiments for today's lab. Lots you can do to prepare for this one. For each of the four sections, have a go at writing the relevant chemical equations and think about what mathematics you're going to need to support your work. In all cases, it will either be one of the equations we've discussed together in this pre-practical video, or it will require the use of some of the simple tools that you've been using for quite some time now, including number of moles, masses, molar masses, concentrations, and volumes. Hope you enjoy yourself in there. Good luck.